it's been a while since we've been able to uh, dive into the book of Judges, so just kind of a little bit of a recap. Uh, several weeks ago, we talked about Gideon, and we talked about how Gideon had started off really well, uh, was very faithful, and then kind of towards the end of his, uh, his reign as a judge, uh, he began to uh, try to grab too much power. He began to start act like, acting, acting like a king. And then we see um, Abimelech, who was not one of the judges, but was um, one of uh, uh, Gideon's sons, who tried and was even more ambitious to trying to become like a king. And um, we saw the, the tragedy of how that, how that uh, uh, story unfolded. Um, now we get to Judges chapter 10. Um, it starts off with a couple of uh, what the Bible describes as minor judges. So it's going to mention, um, you know, in verse 1 of chapter 10, after Abimelech died, Tola the son of Puha, the son of Dodo, a man of Issachar, arose to save Israel. And he lived in Shamir in the hill country of Ephraim. He judged Israel 23 years, and then he died and he was buried. Then it talks about Jair, who was from Gilead, and he arose and judged Israel for 22 years. Uh, he uh, had 30 sons, they rode on 30 donkeys, and they had 30 cities in the land of Gilead. And they uh, are called Havoth Jair to this day. And Jair died and was buried in Kaman. And so just a little short story about these guys. Um, uh, the, the narrator did not, did not uh, include just a ton of details with those guys. But now we get to our next major judge, Jephthah. Uh, and in verse 6, we see the cycle starting again. Um, <clears throat> then the sons of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord. They served the Baals and the Ashtaroth, the gods of Aram, the gods of Sidon, the gods of Moab, the gods of the sons of Ammon, the gods of the Philistines. Thus they forsook the Lord, and they did not serve Him. So I want you to notice something here. This is a little different than the past ones, uh, the past judges that we've seen in that... Uh, Typically it said, okay, they serve the Baals and the Ashtaroth, so they serve this particular god. But here we have seven different deities that are listed um, that the children of Israel are worshiping and following after. Seven different deities. And it's interesting to note that these deities all come from people that they had conquered or would be, that they had conquered at one time but had oppressed them at, at, for a time as well. And so these, these people groups that lived around them you would expect after being uh, oppressed by the Moabites that they would reject those, the Moabite gods. You would, sub, you would suggest after the, the nation of Ammon or the Philistines oppressing them and killing them and causing them all sorts of strife that they would shy away from those gods. But instead we find the children of Israel worshiping those gods. And um, So let's, let's see how this turns out. So verse 7, as we expect, the anger of the Lord burned against Israel. And he sold them into the hands of the Philistines and to the hands of Ammon. They afflicted and crushed the sons of Israel that year. And for 18 years they afflicted all the sons of Israel who were beyond the Jordan in Gilead and in the land of the Ammonites. The sons of Ammon crossed the Jordan to fight against Judah, Benjamin, and the house of Ephraim, so that Israel was greatly distressed. And so um, this is very typical of God's judgment. Just like we talked about in Romans chapter 1 with the repeated phrase, God gave them over, God gave them over, God gave them over. And so they desire to worship the gods of these people and God says, okay, fine. If you, if you want to be like an Ammonite, then you'll be like an Ammonite. And the Ammonites are going to come take over your land. If you want to be like a Philistine and worship a Philistine God, then you can, you can do so. This is what you can have. Um, and so God... As in, in, in a typical fashion, judges the people of Israel by giving them exactly what they asked for. Um, <clears throat> so verse 10, Then the sons of Israel cried out to the Lord, saying, We've sinned against you, for indeed we have forsaken our God, and we have served the Baals. The Lord said to the sons of Israel, Did I not deliver you from the Egyptians, from the Amorites, from the sons of Ammon, from the Philistines? And when the Sidonians and the Amalekites and the Mayanites oppressed you, you cried out to me and I delivered you from their hands. Yet you have forsaken me and served other gods. Therefore, I will no longer deliver you. Go out, go and cry out to the gods which you have chosen and let them deliver you in your time of distress. So it's interesting that when 
God's reply to the people when they cry out to him, before when we've seen the cycle in the judges, the, the people of Israel cry out to God, God raises up a judge and saves them. Here in this instance, God says, I'm not going to do it. I'm done. I'm not, I'm not going to save you this time. If, if you have decided to go out and serve these other gods, then let them save you. It's also interesting to note that God recounts how faithful he has been to save the people, and he actually lists seven different instances in which he has saved them. So, you know, thinking about uh, how the, the number seven symbolizes perfection or completion, the children of Israel had completely given themselves over to idolatry, sevenfold idolatry they had, they had given their lives to. And God says, I have saved you completely. I have saved you seven times. And, you know, this is not an exhaustive list of the times that God has delivered them, but the author's making a point. He's making a point that God has saved them every time they have been, they have been unfaithful and have been completely unfaithful. God has completely saved them when they repent. But at this time, God says, no, I'm not going to do it. If, if you want to serve these other gods, then you let them save you. And uh, I'm, I'm done with you. Verse 15, Then the sons of Israel said to the Lord, We have sinned. Do to us whatever seems good to you. Only please deliver us this day. So they put away their foreign gods from among them, and they served the Lord, and he could bear the, mer the misery of Israel no longer. So this is different. To begin with, when they first approached God, they wanted God to deliver them. And it seems like that's all they wanted. They just wanted God for His power. They didn't want God for Himself. And their, their repentance only went as far as their words. Well, when God told them, No, I'm not going to save you. I've delivered you seven times before. I've delivered you countless times. Um, this is where they realize we have really messed up. And they understand the nature of what they've done because they call it what it is. They call it sin. They call what they do sin... They recognize where they have gone astray, where they have broken God's law, and they begin to put action to their words and show true repentance in, in getting the gods out of their house and turning from the wicked ways that they have been engaging in and instead turning to God. When God sees this act of repentance, um, He comes to a point where He is impatient with their suffering. So, when this chapter first starts, he's impatient with their sin. He's impatient with their idolatry. And then seeing their repentance, God's impatience turns towards their suffering and says, okay, now I'm impatient with that. We see this several times in the Old Testament where it seems like God changes his mind. In fact, sometimes the word that's used in these type instances is repent, that God repented. Um, you know, we see this when... Uh, when um, Abraham is, is bargaining with God over Sodom and Gomorrah, and, and it seems like Abraham could change God's mind. Um, and, but we know that's not true. We know that God's mind doesn't change. We know from Scripture repeatedly that God's character is immutable, that He doesn't change. There is no, there is no shadow of change in Him. God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. So this is kind of difficult to have these... This, story and try to figure out what's going on that God on one hand says I'm not going to deliver you and on the other hand says okay now I'm impatient now now I'm, I'm tired of seeing you suffer I'm going to deliver you and um, you know I think probably the first uh, way that we try to wrap our heads around this those of us with young kids have you ever punished your kid and then realize, oh, that was probably way too severe. I probably, probably need to back up a little bit and change things. And, you know, we all do that because we're imperfect. But I don't think that's what God's doing here. Um, I think that's a too simplistic of an explanation. And it, that kind of tarnishes God's character because God has clearly demonstrated His character to us in Scripture. And His character is that He doesn't change. His character is that He's holy and He's righteous and he has wrath that is stored up for sinners. And his character is also that he is forgiving and that he's loving and he's full of loving kindness. So go with me to a very familiar passage, Exodus chapter 34. And this is, of course, when God tells Moses, this is who I am, this is what my character is. And it's a very clear, um, a, a very clear example of of how both of these aspects of God's character uh, are 
uh, both present, both active, and they don't contradict one another. Um, so uh, Exodus 34 uh, verse 5, The Lord descended in the cloud and stood there with Moses as he called upon the name of the Lord. Then the Lord passed by in front of him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness and truth, who keeps loving kindness for thousands, who forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin, yet by no means will leave the guilty unpunished, visiting iniquity on the fathers of their children and of their grandchildren to the third and fourth generations. This is how God describes Himself. Both of these things are true, and that God is forgiving, gracious, and kind, but God is also wrathful and righteous and holy and will not leave sin unpunished. So on one hand, He forgives sin. On the other hand, He punishes sin. And it's hard for our, our human minds to, to wrap our head around how this can be. Um, and that is where we see uh, this is uh, uh, where, where God is at in this period in Israel's history in, in Judges chapter 10. Verse 17, Then the sons of Ammon were summoned, and they camped at Gilead. And the sons of Israel gathered together and camped in Mizpah. The leaders uh, of Gilead said to one another, Who is the man who will begin to fight uh, against the Ammon, against the sons of Ammon? He shall be head over the inhabitants of Gilead. So the elders of Gilead get together and they decide, all right, whoever is going to stand up and lead us and, and, and free us from, from the Ammonites, um, this person, we're going to make them uh, uh, the, the governor or leader. We're going to put him in a position of authority over us. Um, and so it's kind of interesting that in verses uh, 15, we see what appears to be a true heartfelt repentance, and we're going to turn to God. And then in verse 17, they start looking for a man to come save them rather than looking for God. So one thing that's interesting to point out is the rest of the judges that we see, God had appointed them. You think about Gideon. Gideon was minding his own business. He was in a wine press, tr uh, threshing out the wheat, and he was actually hiding, and God found him and said, you're going to be my man. Well, here we have, and then of course Abimelech decided on his own, I'm going to be the man. Well, then now the, the, the uh, elders and the magistrates and all the high people in Gilead had decided we're going to go find the man. So uh, chapter 11 introduces us to Jephthah. Uh, so chapter 11. Now Jephthah, the Gilead, uh, was a valiant warrior, uh, but he was the son of a harlot. And Gilead was the father of Jephthah. Gilead's wife bore him sons. And when his wife's sons grew up, they drove Jephthah out and said to him, You shall not have an inheritance in our father's house, for you are the son of another woman. So Jephthah fled from his brothers and lived in the land of Tob. And worthless fellows gathered themselves around Jephthah, and they went out with him. So the word went out with him meant that when he would go on, it kind of meant that Jephthah was like a pirate or something. He would go and raid, and he had this group of thugs that, that gathered themselves around him, and they would go and raid and steal, and that's how he made his living. He was a thug or a gangster or however you want to think about it. But, uh, you know, Jephthah is kind of a wily guy. He got kicked out of his, out of his uh, household. He didn't get any inheritance from his father because his, he was an illegitimate child of his father. And so he got kicked out of his hometown. He had to go find some other place to be. And he managed to, uh, because of his, his uh, street smarts, because of his strength, because of his uh, strategic mind and how he thought, he was able to come up with a way to, to live day to day by being a thug. And so that's what he did. Um, verse 4, it came about after a while that the sons of Ammon fought against Israel. When the sons of Ammon fought against Israel, the elders of Gilead went to Jephthah from the land of Tob, and they said to Jephthah, Come out and be our chief, that we may fight against the sons of Ammon. So the thought is uh, that these are actually his brothers, his half-brothers, that uh, had originally kicked him out, that now they've risen to a position of prominence in the government of Gilead, and they're they're now going back to Jephthah. They see what he's been able to accomplish uh, by, um, with his band of, of ne'er-do-wells. And uh, they decide to uh, go ask him to be the guy, to, to, to lead the army. 
What's interesting is when they hatch their little plan at the end of chapter 10, um, you'll notice that your Bible probably says head. He will become head over the inhabitants of Gilead. Some other translations may have leader or something like that. Um, it's actually two different Hebrew words from what they said they were going to do to what they offered Jephthah. So they said they were going to make him like the governor of their city. So they were going to give him a, a position of political authority. But whenever they go to Jephthah in verse 7, um, verse, uh, but, uh, verse 6, sorry, when they go to Jephthah in verse 6, they want him to be their chief. And that doesn't really sound like much of a distinction, but in the Hebrew, the distinction is that he was going to be like a military leader, like a general or commander or something, but not get the other position of being the governor, which was originally promised. When they came up with this deal and said, if anyone will, will come and, and, and lead us against Ammon, we're going to make you the governor of the city. And then when they went to Jephthah, they said, well, you can come and be our military commander. And they kind of left that other part of the offer out. Um, so, verse 7, Then Jephthah said to the elders of Gilead, uh, Did you not hate me and drive me from my father's house? So why have you come to me now when you are in trouble? The elders of Gilead said to Jephthah, For this reason we have now returned to you, that you may go with us and, and fight with the sons of Ammon and become head over all the inhabitants of Gilead. So now they're going back to using that word of putting him in control. And this seems like, you know, kind of a silly thing to quibble over, but they're treating Jephthah the same way they treated God. They wanted God to free them from the oppression of Ammon, but they did not want to make God Lord. They did not want to submit to Him. And now they come to Jephthah the same way, and they say, Jephthah, we want you to help us out, and then go away. <laughs> we, don't, we don't really need you around. We don't need to take orders from you. We don't want to submit ourselves to you. And Jephthah pushes back on that, and they finally relent and say, okay, fine. If you, if you can do it, if you can free us from the Ammonites, then we'll make you head. So we already see from the high point at the end of chapter 10 where they repented, and it seemed like a real repentance. We're already kind of seeing these folks really show their true colors. Um, and so anyways, so Jephthah is able to, to talk to them and get them to agree to do that. So then in verse 9, they, they, um, he agrees to do that. And uh, they take him back and they swear him in at Mizpah and make all this stuff official. So the first thing that Jephthah is going to do in verse 12, uh, he's going to send messengers to the sons of Ammon. He's going to ask them, why are you doing this? And the king of Ammon responds back and says, well, the reason that I'm attacking is because this particular plot of land, and I, was, I had a map, but I couldn't get it to work, so you just have to imagine with me or flip to the back of your Bible and look at the map. This particular plot of land was supposed to belong to the Ammonites, and uh, I want it back. So that's the reason I'm here. You give me the land, I go away. Well, Jephthah's a super smart guy, and he sends a message back and says, no, 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 listen, this land doesn't belong to you, and here's the reasons why. Number one, when we came, and he gives them a history lesson, when we came from Egypt and we went and he talks about them going through the desert, talks about the episode where um, they had to go around other nations' land because they wouldn't let them cross. Talked about how the Moabites wouldn't let them pass, so they had to go around and all this other. So anyways, long story short, he says, no, we came up this way and here's the reason why. And when we got there, the land was given to us by our Lord. And... Then he goes and appeals to them on a theological basis. And he's, the way that uh, these cultures understood the, uh, the actions of their gods that they worshipped is if you won the battle, if you battled between another nation, then whoever's god was on the winning side was the god who was in control and, and, and that, that uh, had sovereignty over what happened to the other people. And he says, no, so we went, we battled against you guys 300 plus years ago, and we won. So Yahweh, the one true God, gave us this land. Um, and then the third appeal that he has is he says, well, and also, it's been 300 and something years. Why is it just now an issue? Um, so this angers the, the Ammonite king, and he uh, ends up just not responding. And so they rush in, and they go to... Uh, and decide to go ahead and do 
battle. We're, we're done talking. We're not gonna. We're not gonna um, negotiate anymore. Um, we're just gonna fight. So that leads us down to uh, verse twenty-eight. But the king of the sons of Ammon disregarded the message which Jephthah had sent him. Verse twenty-nine. Now the spirit of the Lord came upon Jephthah, so that he was pressed, so that he passed through Gilead and Manasseh, and then he passed through Mizpah of Gilead. And on from Mizpah of Gilead, he went to the sons of Ammon. And Jephthah made a vow to the Lord and said, If you will indeed give the sons of Ammon into my hand, then it shall be that whatever comes out of the doors of my house to meet me when I return in peace from the sons of Ammon, it shall be the Lord's, and I will offer it up as a burnt offering. So what's interesting here, even though verse 29 tells us that the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jephthah, God did not ask him to make this vow. This is something he came up with on his own. We don't see anywhere in the text that says that God told him to make this vow. Um, the Spirit of the Lord coming upon Jephthah empowered him to do what God's will was, and that was to defeat the Ammonites. So as far as God is concerned, this battle's already won. God's decided to act, and Jephthah, for whatever reason, has decided to make this ridiculous vow. Um, a lot of people want to look at this and say, okay, well, you know, what? maybe he thought that his dog or something was going to come out, or maybe he thought like a cow or a goat or something was going to come out of his house first. But these people aren't like us. They didn't keep animals in their house. They kept people in their house. They kept animals in the barn. So when he makes this vow, he has to know there's a very good chance that someone from his family is going to come out of the house. And he's decided to sacrifice them. And the word is literally as a burnt offering. It's not that he's going to dedicate it to the Lord like Samuel was dedicated to the Lord. It's not, it's not that he's going to give an offering on their behalf. It's, I'm going to put them on an altar. I'm going to kill them, and I'm going to burn them. Um, so, I don't know what possessed Jephthah to do this. The only thing I can figure is that Jephthah has been so steeped in the idolatry of his culture that he's responding to the God of Israel in a way that you would respond to the God of, of these, these false idols that were around them. So what's interesting in doing a little research on this, you know, we talked about in verse chapter 10 that they had, they had served the Baals, the Astaroths, and so forth and so on, and the gods of Ammon. Well, does anyone know the names of the idols that the Ammonites worship? Moloch. Moloch was the name of the god that the Ammonites worship. There was another one too, but... And Moloch was a god, and the, the main thing, if you know one thing about Moloch, was he was worshipped how? Child sacrifice. Child sacrifice. That's how you worship the god of Moloch. So Jephthah, in going against the Ammonites, is worshipping the god of Israel in the way that you would worship the god of the Ammonites. His worship is totally messed up. He does not understand God. He does not know God's law. You know, at this time, the Israelites would have had the Torah, because Moses has been dead for centuries. They would have had the Torah. They would have Deuteronomy, where it says that God abhors human sacrifice. There's several places in Deuteronomy and Leviticus where, where God says, do not do this. Do not worship Moloch. Do not sacrifice your children. There's even... Um, uh, some verses in Leviticus where uh, if you make some sort of vow and another person is, is brought into that and supposed to be a, a, a sacrifice as part of that vow, there was actually a money amount that you could pay that would satisfy that vow without having to sacrifice the person because God hated this type of worship because it's not the way that God wants to be worshipped. And we know from looking at the Old Testament, specifically in, in uh, Numbers, when Aaron's sons decided to worship God in a way that wasn't appropriate, God was very angry about that. And, and so God has a particular way that He wants to be worshipped. And Jephthah, in his ignorance, I hope it's his ignorance, that he worships God in, in this way. And so it's really easy for us to have what, uh, what uh, C.S. Lewis would call chronological snobbery, where we look back on something that happened a long time ago and think, oh, how, how silly of those people, how, you know, how ignorant they are. But how often do we find ourselves in today's culture worshiping God in a way that lines up more with the world than it does with His Word? How often do we see that? And so 
a lot of times we are no different than Jephthah. And, you know, what Jephthah lost, not to ruin the rest of the story for you, he lost his daughter because of this. So I think the difference is, I don't, I don't think there's any difference today. If we don't pay attention closely to how we worship God and don't hold fast to the way that God desires to be worshipped, as spelled out in His Word, the sacrifice will be our children. Perhaps not on a burnt altar, but if you'll remember from, I think, Judges chapter 2, it just took one generation of, of the children of Israel not being taught what God had done for them that they forgot and that uh, the idolatry crept in, and they forgot who, who God was and what God had done because they didn't teach their kids. So, anyways, um, the story goes on. He makes this foolish, foolish vow. Um, and uh, verse 32, Jephthah crossed over to the sons of Ammon to fight against them, and the Lord took them into his hand, and he struck them with a very great slaughter from Aurora, and to the entrance of Mineth, uh, 20 cities as far as Abel Karaman, the sons of Ammon were subdued before the sons of Israel. Uh, when Jephthah came home to his house at Mizpah, behold, his daughter was coming out to meet him with tambourines and with dancing. Now she was his one and only child. Besides her, he had no son or daughter. When he saw her, he tore his clothes and said, Alas, my daughter, you have brought me very low, and you are among those who trouble me. For I have given my word to the Lord and cannot take it back. She said to him, My father, you've given your word to the Lord. Do to me as you have said, since the Lord has avenged you of your enemies and the sons of Ammon. She said to her father, Let this thing be done for me. Uh, leave me alone for two months, that I may go to the mountains and weep because of my virginity, and I will I and my companions. Then he said, Go. So he sent her away for two months, and then she left with her companions and wept on the mountains because of her virginity. At the end of two months, she returned to her father, who did according to the vow which he had made. And she had no relations with a man. Thus it became a custom in Israel that the daughters of Israel went yearly to commemorate the daughter of Jephthah the Gileadite four days in the year. What a tragic, tragic way for that story to conclude. That uh, he made this vow which did not accomplish anything. God had decided that he was going to destroy the Ammonites. Why? Because God had grown impatient with their suffering. Because God had chosen this people. And God's character demanded that he act. And God had acted Jephthah doesn't understand that about God. He didn't know God's character. He didn't know that God was going to act based on God's own character and his own righteousness. Instead, Jephthah thought he could manipulate God by, by offering up this sacrifice. And it's a sacrifice that wasn't asked for. And it's a sacrifice that's not worth anything either. This type of sacrifice doesn't save anybody. Even though she was young and Presumably, you know, innocent by our standards, she's not perfect. She's not a perfect sacrifice. And she doesn't, her, her sacrifice accomplishes nothing other than sorrow and sadness. Um, there, you know, I find it interesting, uh, you know, we try to look for the gospel in everything that we see. And what a more clear picture of Jephthah giving his one and only daughter to save Israel. And, but, that is not a perfect sacrifice. It's not a perfect picture, but it's not unlike God giving His one and only Son to save Israel. Um, so after all of this, uh, in verse 12, um, this is kind of an epilogue to the story. Then the men of Ephraim were summoned, and they crossed to uh, Zaphon and said to Jephthah, Why do you cross over to fight against the sons of Ammon without us calling to go with you? We will burn your house down. So we've seen this before uh, when Gideon had his battle against the Midianites. The Ephraimites were mad that Gideon had not, uh, not called them to come fight. Uh, apparently these guys really liked a good fight and were super angry if they got left out of a good fight. And Gideon, in his wisdom, 
use some flattery, use, use some, uh, some soft speech to turn away their anger, and the issue resolved itself. Jephthah's a little different. He's done all the negotiating he's going to do. Um, so when they raise up and start questioning him like this, he just goes to war with them. And they, uh, they battle against them. They win. They run them off. And this would have been another instance where the map was helpful. So Gilead's on one side of the Jordan River and Ephraim is on the other side of the Jordan River. The Ephraimites had gone to battle. They would crossed over the river. And then when Jephthah and his men forced them to retreat, they had to go across the river again. Well, Jephthah set up several guys at the river, and he uh, wanted to uh, slaughter any of the Ephraimites that were trying to retreat. And so the way that he decided who was an Ephraimite and who was not was they had a little, a little password, a little test. They had this word that they had to say, um, uh, shibboleth, um, which is kind of hard to say anyways. And if someone's holding a sword to you, I think I'd have a hard time saying it. Well, apparently the Ephraimites had a different uh, accent, and they didn't say the sh sound uh, like they should. So they said Sibylith. If they said if they couldn't pronounce it correctly, they killed them on the spot. Forty-two thousand men died that day from the country of Ephraim. Again, completely meaningless. This should not have happened. Um, but again, even though Jephthah had the spirit of the Lord on him to win this battle against the Ammonites. Um, it only went that far. And the rest of Jephthah's life and his decision-making and the things that he does are just completely apart from God. We don't see God mentioned anywhere else in the story after, after the Spirit of the Lord came upon him in verse 29 and they beat the Ammonites. Um, so 42,000 of their own countrymen died that day all because of pride and arrogance and jealousy and the refusal of anyone to have the wisdom to diffuse the situation before it turned into this. Um, verse 7, Jephthah judged Israel for six years. Then Jephthah the Gileadite died and was buried in one of the cities in Gilead. And then it goes on to mention a couple of other judges. But notice something that's missing. There was no peace. The other judges, at the end of their life, it says they judged Israel for X number of years. Israelites had peace. And then it starts to cycle over again. But there's no peace here. And so the whole time, you, if you're reading through the story of Judges, you see the cycle turning. Every time the Israelites go after the false gods, a, a nation rises up and they're sold into their hands and they're oppressed by this nation. They cry out to God for help. God saves them and raises up a judge. The judge beats the people that were oppressing them. He brings about peace for X number of years. He dies and the cycle starts over. At this point in the book of Judges, the wheels are beginning to come off of this cart, if you will. And now there's no peace. Um, and then by the time that we get to these next couple judges that come up that are, again, um, just kind of minor judges, there's no mention of any great rescue. There's no mention of Israel falling into idolatry and then repenting. It's just life is normal. And then we get to Samson. And spoiler alert, when you get to the end of Samson, there is no peace. There is no rest in Israel. It, it's just over. And then, and then we're left with that phrase at the end of the book of Judges. There's no king in the nation of Israel, and everyone did what was right in their own eyes. So this uh, uh, tragic, tragic tale um, just fits just right at home in the book of Judges with the message that's, that's being taught, that these men that have been raised up that although they were able to accomplish great things. And Jephthah, surprisingly enough, is mentioned in Hebrews chapter 11 for his faith. I'm not really sure what part of his faith the author of Hebrews is, is extolling, but uh, um, he did accomplish God's will through the power of God's Spirit. Um, and that's about all that is commendable about Jephthah. But um, we see through the book of Judges that, that men are incapable of saving Israel completely, saving God's children completely, that men are incapable of, of, um, of resisting temptation to sin and falling into depravity. And the, the trajectory of the book of Judges starts off really good. And then as we get here towards the end, it gets really sad and really tragic. And that's where we're at. So back to... Um, the uh, probably the most complicated uh, thing in here in chapter 10 where we see God's 
wrath being poured out and God then relenting. The only way that this makes sense is through the cross, and that's what you have to understand. That's the key to understanding um, Exodus 34, is that God's character only remains intact because He punishes sin. And sin will be punished, and it will be punished to the full extent possible. Either the people will bear the wrath of their sin, or God's Son will bear the wrath of the sin. But the sin will be paid for. And so that's how we can reconcile God supposedly changing His mind. His mind was not changed. He did say, I'm not going to save you. But because they repented and they put their faith and trust and hope in God, that wrath that was meant for these people of Israel was poured out on His Son instead. And so that is the one shining light in all of this story, is as dark and depressing as it is, the gospel sits behind this story, kind of seen in relief, if you will, where um, nothing about this story seems to be happier or good, but we know the end of the story because we know of Jesus of Nazareth. Let's pray.